start anyway. So I want to thank uh, all of you for being here, and it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, mm -hmm. our guest speaker to uh, Parliament Hill this evening. Some of us already had the opportunity of listening to him earlier today at the committee meeting, and it was, uh, uh, it was an inspiration to, to hear him speak there. There's a problem right now, friends, that's happening in the West, and it is evident in society in general. It's pervasive on university campuses, and it has even found its way into the walls of Parliament, as we have uh, found out uh, in the last weeks and months. And I have mentioned this before in the Senate chamber, but I wanted to share this excerpt from a letter that I received from a social science professor a couple of years ago, and I think uh, many of my Senate colleagues have heard this. She disagreed with the stance I was taking on Bill C-279, an earlier version of what we're now dealing with in Bill C-16. But rather than put forward any points to dispute my arguments, she hurled a number of insults at me. She told me in writing, and I quote, you, sir, are a highly assimilated, unilingual, unhyphenated, Canadian born and bred. And then she continued all in capital letters for my worst characteristics, white, Anglo-Saxon, Christian, male. This was a university professor. The presence of these characteristics alone meant that I have virtually no right to an opinion. After receiving this letter from an academic at a reputable university, I realized how severe this problem really is. I have always believed that we should judge people on the content of their character, and we should be evaluating one's arguments based on their validity. But we are moving forward toward a society where we are taught to take a look at one's immutable characteristics, determine how oppressed they are, and as a result, whether their opinion matters. At the same time, in the name of promoting diversity and inclusion, diversity of opinion is becoming less and less tolerated. The scope of acceptable thought and discourse continues to narrow and turn to <coughs> bigotry are increasingly used in an effort to silence dissent. Today we have with us an academic who has made it abundantly clear that he will not be silenced by this regressive movement. Dr. Gad Saad, and he uh, told me how to pronounce this in uh, Libya, uh, but we'll, we'll leave it at Dr. Gatzat. <laughs> he joins us today with his wife, Annie Orchanian. Thank you. Dr. Sad is a professor of marketing at Concordia University and the holder of the Concordia University Research Chair in Evolutionary Behavioral Sciences and Darwinian Consumption. He has held visiting associate professorships at Cornell University, Dartmouth College, and the University of California, Irvine. Professor Sad has pioneered the use of evolutionary psychology in marketing and consumer behavior. He has written several books along with 75 plus scientific papers, many at the intersection of evolutionary psychology and a broad range of disciplines including consumer behavior marketing advertising, psychology, medicine, and economics. His Psychology Today blog and YouTube channel, The Sad Truth, have garnered over 4.3 million and 5.4 million total views respectively. In addition to his scientific work, Dr. Sad often writes and speaks about topics as varied as postmodernism radical feminism, cultural and moral relativism, political correctness, freedom of speech, and the thought police. Many of you may have seen his talk at this year's Manning Center Conference where he made a powerful presentation exposing the reality of life for many intellectual dissenters on college campuses. It is truly my pleasure to have him here with us today. Please join me 
in giving a warm welcome to the Gadfather himself. <laughs> Is it true that sailors since time 
in memorial have always relied on the fact that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. This is why the next figure you see. And she then used the trick from something called deconstructivism, which is a subfield of postmodernism. She goes, I don't buy labels. What you call east and west are arbitrary labels. What you call the sun, I call dancing hyena. <laughs> To which I answered, well, fair enough. The dancing hyena, which gives me a dancing hyena room if I don't cover myself when I go on vacation, <laughs> it's still the same thing. She said, I won't play those kinds of games. So this proves in the 1600s that the thinker, the radical feminist, the postmodernist, did not include the idea of east and west and the sun, or that only women can be pleasure. This is accepted discourse. Social constructivism starts with a very simple premise. It's called the tabula rasa premise, or the empty place premise of the human mind. We're born with empty minds. There are no biological imperatives. Evolution somehow did not work in the human mind. It worked on lily species. It worked on all of our bodies, but magically evolution stops at the neck. <laughs> Whatever happens from the neck and up is through some mysterious magical force. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're born tabula rasa, and then what makes us who we are is socialization. So, give a little boy a doll, give a little girl a gun, and you socialize them to have different gender roles. Does anybody know what the second figure is, for, is referring to? Does anybody know this is actually for a Canadian guy? David Reimer, who was a gentleman who had had a botched circumcision, rendering him ineffectual in his later life as a functioning, reproductively viable male, he went to see Dr. John Money, who was the leading gender theorist at Johns Hopkins University, who was promulgating the idea that gender is a social construction. There is no such thing as the biological basis of maleness or femaleness. Uh, do reconstructive surgery on David, put him in a dress, call him Linda or whatever name they chose, and boom, you magically have a girl. Guess what David did later in his life? He committed suicide. And then the third case I have here is just, I could have given a million other examples. Uh, this is the example of uh, young men, apparently through social constructivism, learn to be violent because they watch violent video games and listen to violent rap music. Because in history, we have no evidence that young males have ever committed any violence prior to Dr. Dre rapping. Until then, all men held hands and sang John Lennon, imagine. <laughs> and if you detect an indignant voice or tone, that's because this is the ecosystem that I live in 24 hours a day. Let's talk about political correctness. I've analogized this, I think, if I may say, in a very apt way. As an evolutionary uh, behavioral scientist, of course, I'm intimately familiar with the behavior of other animals, not just the human animal. So the spider wasp is actually a very interesting species. It attacks a spider that is much bigger than it. It stings it, and then it carries it to its burrow live, but completely zombified. And then it lays its eggs on the spider so that when the eggs hatch, they can eat the spider in vivo. Well, I argue that political correctness is the collective spider's wasp sting. It is leading us quietly, like zombified mummies, to the abyss of infinite darkness. Let's talk about an example of political correctness. On the left-hand side, I've taken, I, I got this actually from a website called religionofpeace.com. These are the countries, I put them in alphabetical order for you. It would be much more powerful if I actually read all the countries, but I won't for the, the benefit of time. Here are 67 countries spanning every single possible culture, ethnicity, race, skin color, economic system that you could think of, where terrorist acts have been committed. Now, all those terrorist acts have one thing in common. Shh, you don't know what it is. But, <laughs> but 
here is what some of our bien pensant, our nuanced thinkers, have come up with. Let me just read a few of you, a few for you, because I can't. I won't go through all of these. The Paris attack was due to climate change. <laughs> it was due to lack of exposure to art. You've got these young guys in Brussels. Of course, if they're not exposed to Dali and Chagall, they head off to Raqqa to throw off the Shia dogs off the building. I mean, what else could you expect? If you show me more paintings, then I might not throw off those gates from the buildings. And I won't list you all the other ones, but they're hallucinatory. It's difficult to imagine that someone with a functioning brain can actually espouse this stuff, right? Bill Nye, who has a profoundly large following, said, well, of course solar panels are in part to blame for the Paris attack. People think that I'm, I'm satirizing. You can look it up. It will be there. Bill Nye makes a link between solar panels, the drought, climate change, and the Bataclan but, attack in Paris. That's political correctness. Let's talk about examples where people are offended. And I tried to pick specifically Canadian examples. I'm speaking here in front of you, at the Canadian Parliament. A UBC law professor, Lorna June McHugh, let me just read it for you. McHugh has alleged that peer-reviewed research is contrary to indigenous oral traditions and the UBC's research standard effectively discriminated against her, quote, race, color, ancestry, and place of origin and sex. So, for those of you who don't know, academics are supposed to create knowledge and disseminate knowledge. The way we create knowledge is we publish it. We come up with stuff. We publish it in academic journals. We publish it in books. We publish it in a myriad of ways. That process is racist against her because in her tradition, it is through oral transmission that it happens. That particular case was actually, I don't know if it's now been heard, but by a human rights tribunal. It wasn't laughed out. People didn't look at her and say, my goodness, could you actually have the chutzpah to say something like this? No, it was taken seriously. This is a good one. <coughs> Anissa Rauhani, an Iranian woman at Queen's University, wanted to find out how bigoted, diabolical, and racist Canadians are. And so she decided to don a hijab for 18 days so that she could see, well, exactly that, how bigoted people would be towards her. To her shock, and the surprise, and perhaps dismay, she found out that most people were incredibly courteous, kind, and respectful. Aha! They are racist bigots. <laughs> because only racist bigots would seek to overcompensate their internalized racism by being overtly kind. <laughs> so if I am a bigot, I'm a bigot. If I'm not a bigot, I'm a bigot. All roads. <laughs> if you thought this is the top of the lunacy, the night is just getting started. <laughs> Did you know that to not rape is racist and bigoted? So the Einstein in this case is a doctoral student, Tal Dinsan, at Hebrew University who did, a, did research, conducted research to demonstrate that the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, are a bunch of raging lunatics who go around raping tons of Palestinian women because they hold power. She found out that there wasn't a single reported case of rapes. Not one. Not a single one. Nothing. Zero. What did she conclude? Those Jews are so evil. She's Jewish. That's the self-adulation. They so dehumanized 
the honorable brown people of Palestine, that they didn't even feel them worthy enough to rape them. <laughs> Am I making this stuff up? No, you can look it up. So when I see the types of haughty responses that I saw earlier today in Senate, these are folks who don't know what's happening in the world. These are folks who truly live in an ivory tower. I also live in an ivory tower, but I'm seeking to dismantle that ivory tower because it is an injury to truth and true human dignity. To call barbaric practices barbaric is racism. Now, of course, later he walked that back, but he only did so after there was a blowback against him. What's important from a psychological perspective, what's telling is what's the first response you have. Not the response you have after 73 consultants tell you what to say the next day. The original response is you're not angry at spousal abuse, honor killings, female genital mutilation, forced marriages, child rights, or other gender-based violence. Who's the liberal? I'm the liberal. Because I think that these people should be protected. The one who says that it is wrong to call these things barbaric is not the true liberal. I'm the true liberal. This is a woman who is an anthropologist who recently went on Tucker Carlson's show. For those of you who don't know Tucker Carlson, he's a Fox News guy. Uh, I hope that I won't get fired from my university for saying that I watched Fox News. Keeps my, keeping my fingers crossed, hopefully I won't be fired. It's got uh, She went on Tucker Carlson to argue for female genital mutilation. And her argument was, you could, you could go, after we finish this, just go and watch it. She was disgusted that he did not believe in gender egalitarian surgeries. I mean, little boys get circumcised, so are you going to be sexist and not be for cutting off clitorises? What kind of sexist thing are you? It's difficult to imagine that this person thought that this was an appropriate position to take. And she's using gender equality to support taking five-year-old girls and doing infibulation on their genitalia or cutting off their clitorises. Of course, she calls it, well, it's just a prick. It's a symbolic prick. Well, in some cases, it's a symbolic prick. In other cases, it's not. Bear with me as I read this for you. This is a fantastic article written by uh, this gentleman. So the title of the article is, I am a liberal professor and my liberal students terrify me. Right? He's a liberal guy, he's a progressive guy. So that's true. I have intentionally adjusted my teaching materials, so think back to any of you who heard me give my testimony earlier today about the issues of the dangers of these types of uh, forces. So I have intentionally adjusted my teaching materials as the political winds have shifted. I also make sure all my remotely offensive or challenging opinions such as this article are expressed either anonymously or pseudo-anonymously. Most of my colleagues who still have jobs have done the same. Hurting a student's feeling, even in the course of instruction, that is absolutely appropriate and respectful can now get a teacher into serious trouble. In this type of envi environment, boat rocking isn't just dangerous, it's suicidal. And so teachers limit their lessons to things they know won't upset anybody. This shift in student-teacher dynamic placed many of the traditional goals of higher education, such as having students challenge their beliefs, off limits. So it's not just that students refuse to countenance uncomfortable ideas, they refuse to engage them, period. Is this good? Is this what we want for our universities? I took this from the internet, I don't remember exactly where, we condemn freedom of speech that hurts other people's feelings. I'm just going to read two testimonies. These are two of a much broader range of testimonies that I read, as Senator Flett mentioned earlier, at my Manning uh, conference address. Uh, I just took these two because they're sort of short and will make the point. I received a numerable number of these. This is actually from a student in Ontario, that's why I chose it, because we're in Ottawa. 
help, I'm a, I, I remove X, 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 Y, Y, I just remove the identity. So help, I'm a fourth year student in a five year teaching program. I'll be heading to Y, Y, Y next year for my one year of teacher's college. Only recently have I realized the radical left wing messages embedded in virtually all of my classes, and I know it will only get worse at Y, Y, Y. What can I do about this? How do I stand up for the truth without risking my career as an elementary school teacher? Thank you. And here is one from a professor. And again, please be mindful that I received innumerable such emails. As a fellow professor who has been frustrated by the discourse within academia on issues such as political correctness, moral relativism, and social justice, I'd like to thank you for speaking up the way you have been from within academia. I see otherwise very reasonable and capable people abandoning reason and power to the narrative of the regressive left on many social issues. Yes, because they've been parasitized by viruses of the human mind. Here is a study from the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms here in Canada. For those of you who don't know their work, you should. They're doing very important work. They go around ranking universities, Canadian universities, on four metrics. University policies, university practices, student union policies, student governance, and student union practices in terms of freedom. Do they promote freedom or do they hinder it? And then they, then they give grades A, B, C, D, F to the universities. So out of 55 universities that were graded on four metrics, so there are 220 grades, eight received an A. That should worry MPs or senators who are sitting here. That should be very worried. We should be having all A's. Why don't we? This is at the March of Science that happened because Donald Trump was going to end all science. We were going to enter a nuclear holocaust. And so this is what came out at the March of Science website. And then, perhaps because of some of my outspokenness and a few other high-profile academics, they took it down. So maybe now you won't see it, but there is such a thing as a screenshot. So at the March for Science, this is a march to promote science. At the March for Science, we are committed to centralizing, highlighting, standing in solidarity with, and acting as accomplices with black, Latinx, I had to look that up on Google, <laughs> Asian and Pacific Islander, indigenous, non-Christian, Christians don't apply to <laughs> women, people with disabilities, poor, gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, trans, non-binary, agender, and intersect sciences, scientists and science advocates. I won't read the rest. Because you can't study number theory or, or neurosciences or engineering without having the diversity of an intersex person. I mean, how did you understand the distribution of prime numbers without having an overweight Lebanese guy helping you do this diversity issue? <laughs> and then here we have things to stop denying the existence, climate change, white privilege, male privilege, environmental racism. Environmental racism is the idea that climate change is racist. Climate change has a disproportionately negative effect on people of color. Therefore, that's called environmental racism. This is not satire, this is real stuff, this is this work. This is in women's studies programs, and in ethnic studies, and in peace studies. Oh yes, oh yes. Oh. Canada's academic excellence will now be guided by identity politics. I hold the Concordia University Research Chair which is the university equivalent of a Canada Research Chair. Canada Research Chairs are meant to promote excellence in science in Canada, either by attracting people to come to Canada or by making sure that the top scientists don't leave Canada. It should be based on a very clear set of metrics, your scientific excellence, apparently no longer. Now it's every university has to demonstrate that they have a diversity and inclusion plan that where they seek to appoint as Canada research chairs the highest possible accolade of science in Canada based on your identity. Yeah, I wonder what go wrong with that. Yeah. Let's see if, the, if and, and by the way, one of the groups that was identified for help here, 
Aborigines, Aboriginals, uh, women, and two other groups, uh, persons with disabilities, and members of visible minorities. Well, luckily, as a, as a person from the Middle East, so therefore I have all the skin. I'm waiting for my camera research here. I don't need to do any more uh, productivity. I just have to send them a picture of my skin. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how poorly women are doing in universities. Because, of course, we need the Canadian government to intervene to help the rampant sexism that's taking place. So there must be rampant sexism against women, right? Let's check it out. Let's see. Now, I know that facts can be sexist and racist, but let's work through these facts. Here is the, at the American universities. Uh, let me, I, I mean, I put the whole details, but just, if you just hear, listen to me, I'll just explain to you this very quickly. They look at four degrees, associate degree. Maybe you don't know that application in Canada. That's, if you like, half a bachelor's. It's two years of a bachelor. Their, their bachelor's four years there, right? They finish in grade 12. So associate degree is half a bachelor. So they look at associate degrees, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and doctoral degrees across five races, okay? White, black, Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islander, and American Indian Alaska Native. So there are four, four degrees by five races. So there are 20 cells. And in each cell, they counted what's the ratio of men to women getting degrees, if you follow what I'm saying? So, uh, in the associate degree in white, what's, what's the number of men, what's the number? So we can do that for all 20 cells. Out of the 20 cells, how many of the cells did women outnumber men in graduation? Do I have this stuff here? Well, I didn't, I didn't give it to you, right? Now, if it's rampant sexism, we expect 19 out of the 20 cells to be more men than women, yes? Rampant sexism. How many of the 20 cells did women outnumber men as graduates? Therefore, it will be the opposite of sexism as, as promulgated in this narrative. How many of the 20? Can I just get a guess? 17. 17? 17. No. 17. 17? No, 17 was for the earlier data. The rampant sexism got worse. <laughs> In 20 out of 20 cells across all races and all degrees, women graduate more than men. Geez, we've got to find some sort of program to help women out because the rampant sexism is crazy. <laughs> Let's look at the next one from Canada. Rampant sexism at Canadian medical schools. Oh, look, look at this right-wing, bigoted newspaper, McLean's. <laughs> Women outnumber men at most medical schools. That's strange. But the Canada Research Chair is trying to give, I mean, we need to help women. But most women, most students at medical schools are not women. It turns out that out of 17 medical schools, 13 have more women. But yet, the narrative of we don't have, we need to help women. Now, I'm not suggesting that there hasn't been institutional discrimination against women in the past. I mean, only a fool would say that. Of course that's true. But do we hang on to a narrative of victimhood when today it's the exact opposite that's happening? And it's breathtaking. Well, well, look at the diversity. Men's 100 meter Olympic champions since 1984. <coughs> oh look, they come from many different cultures. We have some Americans, we have a guy from Jamaica, we have a guy from Britain. I'm trying to look for a unifying theme. I personally can't find it because only racists do, so I can't relate to all you bigots. But no, 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 no quotas or no diversity and inclusion at the Olympics. That's not right. Where are the aboriginals? <laughs> what, about, what about the overweight Middle Eastern men from Lebanon? <laughs> I look at this image and I see super athletic guys who could, I could be at the 90 meter point and they can still outrun me. That's marginalizing me. That's disenfranchising me. Where do I see myself there? I want to see quotas for overweight that it is not Oh boy, look at this diversity. 
Boston Marathon winners since 1991. Kenya, 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 how about we just let people compete and whoever wins, wins? How about we make sure that we have equality of access, but we don't confuse that with equality of outcome? Gee, that sounds like a good idea to me. Nobel Prizes, this is what I'm going to do, so I'm Jewish. <laughs> Nearly 25% of Nobel Prizes in the world are given to Jews. Jews make up 0.02% of the world's population. One quarter of Nobel Prizes go to Jews. To me, there's only one conclusion. It's a Zionist uh, plot. <laughs> Where is the diversity? How to build echo chambers. This is actually Steve Hilton, who was the co-founder of this company, who was the former advisor of the Irish Prime Minister David Cameron. He was recently on my show, and I will be appearing on the show soon. He's got a new show on Fox. So Steve Hilton has started a new company where they do some fantastic stuff, one of which is they calculate professions in terms of how liberal or conservative they are. So they have a continuum, they have a metric, and they have a very interesting methodology to map different professions on this continuum of liberal versus conservative. Now watch to the left, academics, entertainment industry and the media scored as three of the top four most folk liberal. So everywhere where you look to get your information from, you're only getting one point of view. Now there's nothing wrong with having liberal points of view. But if you are a student, <coughs> might it not be a good idea to be exposed to a multiplicity of viewpoints? Not just for the sheer beauty of diversity, but because there are many issues on which the multiplicity of viewpoints is actually relevant. Fiscal policy. Uh, uh, should we have an uh, interventionist strategy or not? Should we be globalist or nationalist? Uh, are you for the death penalty or not? Uh, very reasonable people on both sides of the political aisle could have very strong and compelling arguments for each of these issues. So if I am an undergraduate student in political science or sociology, would I not benefit from having this multi multiplicity of viewpoints? Well, not according to universities, you don't. Here is a study done by Cardiff and Klein. Uh, Dan Klein is an economist who also appeared on my show recently. They looked at the Democrat to Republican ratio at American universities. Across disciplines, it was five to one meaning five times more Democrats than Republicans. Now that's already a gigantic bias. Five to one. I mean, in medicine, if you have a 1.2, that's a 20% chance of you getting it. So one to 1.2 is a huge effect. Five to one is unheard of. So five to one across disciplines, but now watch. In sociology, 44 to one. In ethnic studies, 16 to 1. In performing arts, 16 to 1, and so on and so forth. So in all the fields that are activist fields, that are ideological fields, you almost have a perfect echo chamber. Therefore, all the students that come out all ate the exact same attitudes. They haven't been exposed to a multiplicity of viewpoints. So all forms of diversity are beautiful. Sexual orientation diversity, gender identity diversity, uh, race, ethnic diversity, skin color diversity, but the only diversity that truly matters, which is intellectual diversity, well, we can't have that. And here's my main man, Thomas Sowell, who said, the next time some academics tell you how important diversity is, ask how many Republicans there are in their sociology department. This is Thomas Sowell, who was a very, very famous professor of economics, who, if you'd like, was the original hero to fight political correctness around the time when I was born in the 60s. This guy's been doing this for 50 years. He, he predicted all this stuff before many of us in the room were born. And he's still alive, and I'm, I've been trying to get him on my show, but the damn guy can never be reached. <laughs> but I'll keep trying. 
There's a more recent study by Klein and some of his other colleagues where they looked at the 40 top universities. What you're seeing in the histograms is the ratio of Democrats to Republicans. So for example, in economics, it's 4.5 to 1. In history, 33.5 to 1. Imagine teaching history where almost every single professor that you will ever encounter comes from one particular political and ideological bent. Are you going to get a nonpartisan view of history? Journalism, 20 to 1. Law, 8.6 to 1. Psychology, 17.4 to 1. And the total, 11.5 to 1. That's breathtaking. You might say, well, what about Canadian professors? Well, I'll just, just look at the red part. This is an example also on the paper. Over 40% of professors voted for the Liberal Party, about four times more than voted for the Conservative Party. So it's about four to one there. And about 25.5% of professors self-identify as left-leaning, whereas 4.5 as right-leaning. Again, roughly five to one. So the five to one ratio that was that I quoted earlier from the U.S. is roughly the same as Canada. My last slide. So let me. So what can we do about this? Freedom of speech is everything. All of the forces that are leading us to the abyss of infinite darkness must be dismantled, must be challenged, must be defeated in the battlefield of ideas. Politely, respectfully, but they must be engaged. No more language police, no speech codes, no campus speech codes, no hate speech codes. The only thing that should be disallowed is direct incitement to violence against someone else. Okay. No more thought police. The example of the shackle of political correctness. No more echo chambers that check intellectual diversity. No more identity politics. Instead, promote the dignity of the individual. That's what true liberalism is. Rather than supporting oppression Olympics and victimology poker. No more coddling of the culture of offense and the ethos of perpetual victimhood. No microaggressions on campuses. No trigger warnings. No safe spaces and no cultural appropriation. Those have to go in the garbage bin of history. They're bad ideas. They're totalitarian ideas. They're vile. Do not cede a single inch to any ideology that is antithetical to our secular, modern, and liberal. And I, this, I, I make a distinction here with not full liberal, but liberal values. All ideas beliefs and ideologies are perfectly open to criticism, to debate, mocking, ridicule, and other forms of scrutiny. Nobody cares about your hurt feelings. I get a tsunami of stuff thrown at me every day. I don't recoil into the fetus and suck my tongue. It's called life. Short of direct incitement to violence, eradicate hate speech laws, science, reason, and logic, Trump ideology, Any questions, uh, the doctor said? And as he says, you'll be around. Uh, certainly, you can feel free to to, uh, to walk up and, and, and talk to him. But yes, Jennifer. I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on the Oppression Olympics. Yeah, so Oppression Olympics is basically. Uh, the idea that you compete in the march. So instead of having, let's say, the 100 meters Olympics, what determines who is right, what determines who gets rights, what determines who gets to speak first, is based on what their oppression scores are. So uh, I am a man from the Middle East. I'm a brown guy. I'm overweight. I'm short. I escaped execution. You can't beat me. I'm the king of oppression, right? As a matter of fact, there are websites that satirize this where you can enter your score, and it will tell you what your oppression, oppression score is, and I'm off the charts. And I was joking with Senator Klett, I said my only problem is that if I could somehow get sexual orientation in my profile, because I am cis-normative, heteronormative male, and so by self-identifying as a woman, then my marriage to my wife becomes same-sex, 
and they're not touching me. So I officially hereby declare that I'm a woman and we're married in the same sex. Yes? Um, hi there. So uh, actually, I'm going to provide a little anecdote to add to this. So in the last uh, election of our student association, an example of the oppression Olympics, this candidate, he lost, thankfully. Greg Owens is a queer, white, cis male with multiple psychiatric disabilities studying neuroscience. Example of the, so that's like, imagine a candidate putting that in their, in their line. Um, so, so my question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the government uh, putting in place financial incentives for, um, for universities to have more like diversity of opinion in their teaching staff? I don't know exactly how you would implement it, but for example, so I'm not going to answer directly your question, but uh, I think Donald Trump recently suggested that the universities that are allowing the shutting down of free speech withhold their funds, right? So it's not just a question of people may, might not necessarily be punished unless you actually put extrinsic mechanisms to punish them, right? You, you can't just appeal to their good sense and to their you know, moral virtues. And so there must be a way, I haven't given it enough thought, to actually incentivize universities to break these echo chambers. The specific details I'm unsure of, I have to think about it, but I completely agree with you that there has to be much more time spent on worrying about intellectual diversity rather than on skin color diversity. Prime numbers are prime number in mathematics, whether I'm transgender or not. Yes, sir. So what turns the tide since we're We've actually been experiencing a decrease of freedom of speech. It seems like the virus is strengthening. What what turns the tide? Right. Uh, by people listening to talks like this and saying, "I'm no longer going to be quiet," and I'm going to engage these these forms of lunacy on my Facebook page, at the bar when I'm having a drink, I won't be cowed into silence. I won't be afraid of my professor because I think that he or she or, or they or Xir will give me a poor grade. Okay? Uh, there is no alternative. It's trench ideological warfare. It's dirty, but that's the only way to do it. So I get tons of emails from students who say, you know, because I've been following you and I see, I mean, I get threats, personal threats on me. I mean, I, I don't worry about the transgender. I get guys that are much more violent trying to do bad things, right? So people think, oh, but you're tenured, you're safe. Well, then you don't know the kinds of threats that I face, right? So, yet I, I do it. And so I try to tell those people, because they usually come back to me and say, but, but if I speak out, professor, then I won't have a law career and my girlfriend won't like me. But everybody has a cost to bear. But if each of us says, well, let him carry the cost, while I cower in silence, then it'll be on the broad shoulders of a very few courageous people to carry the mantle for everybody, and that's not fair, and then we will lose the battle. But if everybody gets up and says, with my small voice, I have something that I can contribute to this battle, it could be quickly turned around. You could shame those people, in, because the truth is not on their side, they're idealized, right? The gentleman today who engaged me, they never engaged me on science, they engaged in grandstanding and posturing. Because on the science, with all due respect, I would have wiped the floor with them. So, in You did okay people, now too. Sorry? You did fine now too. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> so, just get engaged. I could just add a supplementary. So, what's, if you have, if you have a hope index, you have 10 year very hopeful, but this is going to turn around, and one year very disillusioned, this is never going to Where's your hope? Even now, I'm going to put on my politician. <laughs> right? Politicians are peddlers of hope. That's what they do. Hope and change. Barack <laughs> and men. Barack, you've given me so much hope. Uh, so, if I'm going to be truthful, I say, look, it's looking pretty bad. But I'd like to peddle hope here and say that the, the ship hasn't sunk yet. And the reality is that even though it remains a very few people who are at the, at the forefront, more people are coming. More people are feeling emboldened. More people are saying, I've had enough. I pay $50,000 to go to this university. I'm always terrified to open my mouth. And so I think it just takes a small little impetus and then the domino effect will come. So I'd like to say that on a scale of zero to 10, I'm a seven of hope. 
So, at the basis of the civilizational model of the West is multiplicity and the exchange of ideas and being welcoming to other uh, members of other civilizational models and incorporating those ideas if they're good. Um, and, but currently the West is suffering this onslaught from other civilizational models and not only the civilizational model of peace, there are other ones including the energy within, the most modern uh, model. How, do we, how does the West protect itself without giving up its own identity? How does, the West, how does the West protect itself without losing multiplicity, without having to build walls to protect itself? <coughs> First of all, you get rid of the self-flagellation of guilt. There is nothing, I mean, uh, a current person born in Canada does not have to feel guilty for what someone else did 200 years earlier by virtue of the fact that they have the same skin use. Okay? So first of all, get rid of the narrative that says that inherently uh, white men bad, right? Christian, white, <laughs> and rest of the world honorable good, right? That's Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the noble savage, right? Uh, all, all indigenous people around the world, you know, had belief on their genitalia, and they walked walked around, you know, smoking pot and making love until white man introduced war to them. Because we have absolutely no archaeological record of violence across tribes prior to white man. So this kind of stupidity has to be challenged. When you say this, I'm going to hold you accountable for this. I'm going to call drinking. Can I say it that word? I'm going to call bullshit. Up. Right? Uh, and the reality is that most people don't have the epistemological security to say BS. Therefore, they cower in silence. And therefore, who gets the only voice? The ideologue. And the ideologue says, hey, don't open your mouth. So, yes, boss, yes, professor. No, you have a right to speak. Everything that we've accomplished that's great in Canada, in the US, in the West, that I didn't have in the Middle East, comes from freedom. Freedom of thought, freedom of speech, economic freedom, reproductive rights, and everything freedom. So let's protect that. Yes, sir. Um, you may not have an answer, a clear answer to this, but um, I was thinking, do you think that the government, like uh, our public education system, should be in a position of, of promoting certain values that we hold dear because it, it does open the can of worms to then they might preach you know, the, the postmodernist lack of values, essentially. But do you think we should be preaching a set of universal values that Canadians hold dear? Well, what I think we should do is eradicate the, the, the ultimate ideal is the pursuit of truth. That's the highest, most noble goal. Hurt feelings should not be at the apex of our ideals, right? Right now, the currency is don't say anything, don't research anything, don't discuss anything that might hurt someone else's feelings. Therefore, if I have to suppress the truth so I can protect his feelings, that supersedes the pursuit of truth. No. The most important idea, in a true philosophical sense, is the pursuit of truth. Be down with your feelings. <laughs> now, I don't mean to imply that we should all walk around frivolously being unkind to each other. That's not at all what I'm saying. We should be respectful to each other, and kind and empathetic and sympathetic and so on. But in a philosophical, epistemological sense, we shouldn't self-censor because we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. So teach kids that the pursuit of inquiry, wherever it might lead you, is the highest. Yes, sir. Professor, when did the West give up on its values and principles and why? So that's uh, going to be covered in my next book, which I'll expect you to buy. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you sign me up. It'll be my honor. Uh, it, it's, it's a long uh, answer, but it's really, so the first slide that I put up, excuse me, the first one with all the different squares, that was the perfect confluence of forces. Now, each one has a different reason why it came up. Let me just go back. So, for example, the ant, I call it, well, I don't know what to call it, biophobia, fear of biology. So, all the social sciences and the humanities have evolved 
over the past 100 years with a deep disdain of biology. Why? Because a whole bunch of miscreants, a whole bunch of Cretans had misused evolutionary theory, right? So for example, the Nazis argued, hey, there's a battle between the races, we are the Aryan race, we won, so let's kill the Jews. What's wrong with that? That's Darwinian, right? Of course, it has nothing to do with Darwin, right? They're, 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 they're misapplying a theory that has nothing to do with this to advance their political goals. So a bunch of social scientists, Pierre Poisson, right, uh, started developing theories that were perfectly removed from reality, but they considered them to be noble, because that way you wouldn't have bigotry and hatred and so on. If you argue that we're all born with empty minds and it's only socialization that makes us who we are, that's a very hopeful message. I could be the next Michael Jordan. I just need to be hugged properly. I just need to have a bit more look. There are no genetic differences between people. There are no IQ differences. There are no differences between men and women. We're all born with equal potentiality. So to answer your question in a much less full way than I would if I had more time, it, it really comes from an honorable place. They're trying to create better societies. In doing so, they end up doing an engineering of society where they remove themselves from truth because they have a higher ideal. They're going to create a more just society, hence social justice warriors. But they are engineering the truth. Biology does matter. There is such a thing as male and female. All my biologist friends would be very, very surprised to know that what, what did you, what did you say? Bi biology of sex is what, what is it that the person from the University of Toronto said? What was their call, Jennifer? It was a transgender study for sex. They said there is no such thing. There's no such thing as biology. I want to call all my very, very accomplished colleagues, all of whom are in the National Academy of Sciences, and tell them that biology is dead. They're out of a job. Toronto University. So it's really a confluence of real cancers of the human mind. One more question, and then uh, we'll we'll be here for a while. We'll mingle, and you can feel free to come up and, and ask uh, Dr. Said any questions. But one more, go ahead. Yeah, on the very lopsided ratio of uh, left wing versus right wing academics, how would you respond to the argument coming primarily from the left that those who are right wing views are simply uneducated, and if they were educated, that everyone yes, I hear that often. Right yes, uh, actually, uh, stupidity is not reserved for one side of the world. Uh, science denialism actually happens across both sides. So, for example, evolution denial is much more likely to be, let's say, in the, in the U.S. context, more Republican phenomenon, right? So, the stereotype of the Southern Republican senator who doesn't think it's stupid evolution—that's true. Uh, on the other hand, uh, rejecting evolutionary psychology and the biological basis of sex differences is much more of a leftist phenomenon. So it's not as though there is only a, there's a monopoly of stupidity and science denialism that only comes from right wing. That's not that's simply not true. Both sides, when they are committed to their pet ideology, lose reason, and that's bad. Colleagues, I think uh, the, uh, the the Gad father here would make a great conservative candidate for the next election. <laughs> Please stay a while and do chat. Thank you very much.